I'm going to finish. I'm going to. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how to finish. If I should read a piece or or tell a story about the book. <laughs> That's really nice of you to say. There are some people saying, "Yeah, do both," and there are some people saying, oh, "Gonna sit here longer." Um, okay, uh, I'm going to make a very quick decision. It'll all depend if I can find the page. It's very professional of me. Uh, to to see if I can um, to find the page that I was going to read. Um, I'm not going to read. I'm going to tell you something, <laughs> and then I might read a little bit. Uh, normally, I don't tell this story unless someone asks me a question about it, and it's usually if someone asks me um, what what do the parents think. Um, the big breakthrough that I had with this book was, I told you about the tour I went on with four other authors. But before that, I got to go to New York and go on this morning show, Good Morning America, and uh, my publisher really thought it was a big deal, and I thought, what are you talking about? I thought it was just going to be like, you know, sunrise or something, and uh, which wouldn't have much of an impact uh, on the book. And they got me media training. And that was when I thought they're serious, you know, uh, they don't want me to screw this up. But I still thought it's not going to be any big deal. And I went up there and I, I got interviewed by this guy uh, about the book because they'd sent him the book on, and hoping for a fluke that he'll read it and uh, that, oh, the, the, the public, what they call, the producer will read it and, uh, and they'll get me onto the show. And uh, it just happened like that. The actual host read it and he said, I want to interview. Um, this guy from Australia and uh, so I got up there and I went to the TV studio and this is one of those only in America stories uh, uh, that we all love and, uh, and I got there into the studio and there was a corridor and uh, it was one of these morning shows and the first thing I saw was a poodle and it was about this big it was huge and, uh, and then there was a Labrador with and an owner uh, who was, she was just mad about this dog, but that dog was wearing a blue spandex outfit. Because uh, there was a segment that was going to be dogs and their clothes uh, in winter. And then there was, uh, then, then after that, the Irish dancing girls came pouring out of the elevator because it was St. Patrick's Day. And uh, after that, and I'm not joking, then this was the final straw, the little people showed up. And, uh, because there was a reality TV show called Little People in a Big World uh, up there about a family that was half little people and half average sized people. And, uh, and we all shuffled into the elevator together to go up onto this show. And uh, I thought, this is all just crazy. I mean, it's going to be, you know, it's all just a bit of a joke. I mean, we're all going to have our four minutes of fame and then we'll all leave and walk off into the sunset together, you know, the dogs. The dancing girls, the little people, and me. And, uh, and uh, so I thought this was crazy. And then we did the, I did the interview, and I was so nervous, and all of that. And the guy who interviewed me, it just couldn't have gone any better. He quoted the book, and he read from the book, and um, and he actually he quoted a, a piece where Death says, uh, "I've seen so many young men in wars over the years, and they think they're running at each other, but they're not. They're running at me." And uh, he quoted that, and. Uh, and then he asked me what my parents thought of the book, and uh, and I say this not just because they're here, but um, and I had to say to him, oh well, my mum's read it three times, but you know, that means nothing, you know, there's a bit of bias there. And, uh, and I said my dad swore at me and said, you know, you made me cry, and he said, well, and the interviewer said, well, the book made me cry as well. And out of the corner of my eye, throughout the whole interview, I could see my editor, who's my publisher as well, and she was smiling at first, and then she was nodding. But then when he says the book made me cry, she was jumping up and down. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell is she doing? And, uh, and, and then we left and she said, this is really good. And, and this was one of those golden days where they told me at that moment too that the film writes of their song. And, uh, and then some of you would, of course, be familiar with Amazon.com and all of that. And, and I'd never checked my Amazon ranking ever before in my life. And, uh, by that afternoon, at the start of the day, apparently the book was number 20,000 and something, which isn't that bad. If I'd looked up my other books, they would have been 1 million and something. <laughs> and they update their bestseller list every hour. And, um, and 
by midday, it was the book had gone from 20,000 to number 11. And by the end of the day, it was number one. And, um, and that's when you realise the power of television. Uh, and, uh, and so that was really crazy. And, uh, and the reason I tell the story is like, sometimes you just have a golden day. Like, I'll never have another day like that. And uh, I called home, I called my wife, and, uh, and I also called my mum and dad. And, uh, and that time, I think you're also a lot more emotional when you're away from home as well. And if, any, if nothing else, at the end of that day, um, it was, must have been 2.30 in the morning when I ran home. And it's probably the first time in 15 years or something like that, probably longer, um, that I told my dad that I loved him. And uh, I hung the phone up and then you know, I just went to pieces. And I thought, if, if this book um, could give me that, uh, well, and nothing else, uh, then it was definitely worthwhile. Uh, so, um, at the end of the day, um, that's why the book means everything to me. Because, I mean, sometimes, you know, I had a lot of luck, um, but the, the first luck was where the book came from. So, uh, I'm going to read one piece very quickly, uh, and then I think we'll call it a night, and uh, you can go. Uh, I just want to say, um, Thanks again for coming because, you know, you could be at home watching TV. <laughs> <laughs> it's a rainy night, you're probably thinking, oh, I've got to get out of my car, get to the thing, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to get wet. Uh, although it's not like a football game or something where it's miserable the whole time. It's, a library's got that nice warmth about it. <laughs> so I'm going to read uh, one piece from the book, and this is where Max, um, the young man who was hiding in the basement, uh, comes back through Liesl's hometown because he's getting marched to the concentration camp in Dachau and uh, Liesl sees him and this is how it goes. I hope I'll, I have another right page of course. Okay, so this is how it works. From the inside, the stream of Jews was a murky disaster of arms and legs, ragged uniforms. No soldier had seen her yet, but Max gave her a warning. You have to let go of me, Liesl. He even tried to push her away, but the girl was too strong. Max's starving arms could not sway her, and she walked on between the filth, the hunger, and the confusion. After a long line of steps, the first soldier noticed. Hey, he called him. He pointed with his whip. Hey, girl, what are you doing? Get out of there. When she ignored him completely, the soldier used his arm to separate the stickiness of people. He shoved them aside and made his way through. He loomed above her as Liesl struggled on, and she noticed the strangled expression on Max Vandenberg's face. She had seen him afraid, but never like this. The soldier took her. His hands manhandled her clothes. She could feel the bones in his fingers and the ball of each knuckle. They tore at her, skin, at her skin. I said, get out, he ordered her. And now he dragged the girl to the side and flung her into the wall of onlooking Germans. It was getting warmer. The sun burned her face. The girl had landed sprawling with pain, but now she stood again. She recovered and waited. She re-entered. This time, Liesl made her way through from the back. Ahead, she could just see the distinct twigs of hair and again walked towards them. This time, she did not reach out. She stopped. Somewhere inside her were the soles of words. They climbed out and stood beside her. Max, she said. He turned and briefly closed his eyes as the girl continued. There was once a strange small man, she said. Her arms were loose, but her hands were fists at her sides. But there was a word shaker too. One of the Jews on his way to Dachau stopped walking now. He stood absolutely still as the others swerved morosely around him, leaving him completely alone. His eyes staggered and it was so simple. The words were given across from the word sorry, the words were given across from the girl to the Jew. They climbed onto him. The next time she spoke, the question stumbled from her mouth. Hot tears poured for room in her eyes, and she would not let them out. Better to stand resolute and proud. Let the words do all of it. Is it really you? The young man asked, she said. Is it from your cheek that I took the seat? <coughs> Max Vandenberg remained standing. He did not drop to his knees. People and Jews and clouds all stopped. They watched. As he stood, Max looked first at the girl and then stared directly into the sky, who was wide and blue and magnificent. There were, he there were heavy beams. <coughs> Sorry. There were heavy beams, planks of sun, falling randomly, wonderfully onto the road. Clouds arched their backs to look behind as they started again to move on. It's such a beautiful day, he said, and his voice was in many pieces. A great day to die like this. 
Liesl walked at him. She was courageous enough to reach out and hold his beard and face. Is it really you, Max? Such a brilliant German day in this attentive crowd. He let his mouth kiss her palm. Yes, Liesl, it's me. And he held the girl's hand in his face and cried onto her fingers. He cried as the soldiers came and a small collection of insolent Jews stood and watched. Standing, he was whipped. Max, the girl wept. Then silently as she was dragged away. Max, Jewish fist fighter. Inside, she said all of it. Maxi taxi, that's what your friend called you in Stuttgart when you fought on the street, remember? That was you, the boy with the hard fists. And you said you would land a punch on Death's face when he came for you. Remember, Max? You told me. I remember everything. Remember the snowman, Max? Remember in the basement? Remember the white cloud with the grey heart? The Fuhrer still comes down looking for you sometimes. He misses you. We all miss you. And that's where I'll stop for tonight. Thank you.